Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Constellation crew from the Brown Planetarium at Ball State University. I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the planetarium here, and I'm joined um, tonight with Ricky. Hi. And Melanie. Hello. And Caleb. Hello. And, and we um, have two other students helping out in the chat today. We have Alec and Nicolette helping out um, to explore a new constellation this week. This week we are exploring Sagittarius, uh, but we're gonna start this program in a similar way to last week. Last week we uh, looked down at an area on campus, and if you joined us last week, we were looking down at the Student Center at Ball State. This week we're looking down at another object on campus, another area on campus, and I want people watching um, to feel comfortable to put questions or comments in the chat and if you have any questions for us, um, you can put them in the chat too, because Nicolette and Alec are gonna be helping you out there. But feel free to answer our questions too. So if you have any um, guesses as to what we're looking at on Ball State's campus right now, put it in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. And I think Ricky, Melanie, and Caleb here can all say um, what this is what kind of the center of our image here is, this area. Uh, but we'll give people just a few more seconds to put their responses in the chat if they have a guess. All right, so uh, Ricky, Mel, and Caleb, what are we looking at here? Looks like I believe we're looking at the tower. The bell tower, yep. So we have the bell tower here on campus. Um, it's casting a long shadow on the bottom here of the, of the images here. And of course, there's more of campus in our view. Uh, but you know, we we love Ball State campus, but we also love the sky um, as a part of the planetarium and our crew here. So we're gonna turn our view up towards the sky and get started with our tour of the sky, specifically that constellation of the week, Sagittarius. So as we turn our view up to the sky, I'm also speeding up time with our planetarium software here. And as we speed up time, the sun, it was hard to see, but the sun set over on our right. And what direction does the sun set in? So if you have a guess, or if you know, put it in the chat. Uh, what direction does the sun set? And we do know that the sun sets in the western sky, not always exactly west, like you might have heard, but it sets over in the western sky. And so, um, Melanie, what does that mean um, for us when we're looking at the sky right now? What direction are we facing if the sun just set over in the west on our right? So I like to remember early in the east. That's a good way to remember where the sun is rising and where it's setting. But if it's setting on our right in the afternoon, evening, then we are facing south. Yeah, if it's setting over on our right in the afternoon or evening, it's that we're facing south here. So we are facing south. We are facing south when we're looking down on our campus, and we're facing south in our simulation here, looking at our sky. And I don't know about you, but I have never seen the sky like this on campus. Uh, there are way more stars in this uh, simulation than I've ever seen on campus. So we have a lot of light from our buildings on campus. And that light makes it really difficult to see um, some of the features that are there in the sky because we have something called light pollution, right? That's the light that's coming from those buildings and streetlights that make it really difficult to see the sky like this. But in our planetarium software and in our planetarium, we can simulate the sky as if it would look in a really dark location, like if everyone lost power in Muncie. And we can see things like um, more stars, and then the band of light here is our Milky Way galaxy, which we'll talk more about later. But going back to Sagittarius, uh, how can we really find it? Mel, help us out. So there's like a little key thing you can look for, a little hack, if you will. Um, we're going to look for a little teapot. So I'll give you a couple seconds, see if you can find it on your own. And if you can't, we'll go ahead and outline it for you. Yeah, so as a reminder, right, like we, we, we can play connect the dots with these stars and make pictures. So you want to connect some stars together uh, or some dots together or those stars um, with imaginary lines and try to view or see or imagine a teapot. 
it's definitely in this field of view. We'll give you a hint that the Milky Way looks like it's coming up like steam a little bit. Yeah. All right, if you found it, go ahead and put in the chat that you found it. And give yourself a pat on the back. Absolutely. It's not the easiest thing to find, but it's definitely easier than finding some other tri groups of stars or patterns in the sky. And actually here on 1C, it really pops. These are actually pretty bright stars. And so that teapot really pops in the southern sky a little bit more than what we're actually seeing here. All right, so let's uh, let's see it. There it is. And great job if you found it, but here was the teapot. Again, that Milky Way, that band of light going across our, our screens here is looking like steam coming out of the teapot, which is quite quite cute, I think. All right, Mel, what else can we what else can we um, find around this teapot? So this teapot is actually not the entirety of Sagittarius. There's a lot more to it. It's just the easiest way to find sort of the general location of Sagittarius. And this teapot is what we call an asterism. So it's not actually the entire constellation. It's just a small section or subset of the stars used. Um, it's usually something that's just a really clear shape, something easy to find or recognizable. And there's also some really popular ones that you've probably heard of. So if you can think of any, uh, leave them in the chat. Um, but if you've heard of anything like the Summer Triangle, or if you've heard of the Bigger Little Dipper, or the Great Square, um, all of these are examples of like common asterisms that we use um, just to help us find constellations that might be a little bit trickier to find. And they're just, they're really useful and we can make all kinds of fun little shapes about it. Um, but if you think of those, can find them a lot easier. Yeah. So, so the teapot is really um, a part of the constellation of the week, Sagittarius. But there's more to it than the teapot, as Mel said. So let's go ahead and show some additional stars that you can connect and imagine these lines here. And just so you know, the lines you know aren't, aren't out there in real life. Obviously, uh, we can just uh, imagine these lines and eventually maybe even see something like a half guy, half horse. I don't know about all of you, but I don't see a half guy, half horse or a centaur. I see a teapot always in the sky. So that's what I use to find it as well. Yeah, I can see the teapot, but if you, uh, I, know, I know this is not a real asterism, but I can kind of see a teacup next to his right hoof. See a teacup? Yeah, with the four or five stars right next to his right hoof. In the front here? Yeah. So like around here? Mm-hmm. Kind of looks like a teacup. It does look like, like a little teacup. Like chip to a Mrs. I've, Potts. I feel like I've I've heard of that before. I I feel like someone else has seen a teacup next to it. Awesome. All right. So anything else, Mel, with the uh, Sagittarius? How do we find it in the sky? So if you tuned in last week and you were able to find Scorpius, it's basically right next door to that. You're going to look in the same general area, sort of straight south. It's going to be a little bit lower in the sky, maybe, than you would think. Um, so as long as you're facing south and you have a good open view, you should be able to find the teapot, at least. And then if you're lucky, you can see all of that there, too. Yeah. Through imagination. Yeah, so everything in this area of the sky, and it's, you know, not all the stars that are connected with these lines here, but there's more to the constellation than that. So the constellations are kind of like puzzle pieces. Or it's a big, big map of the sky, and we talked about that last week, but um, there are some objects in Sagittarius that we're going to look at today, and two are actually really apparent. Um, they're very, very bright, and they're not stars at all, even though they look like stars in our simulation here. And someone already said in the chat that they found one um, and knew what it was. They said, uh, Terry said that he found Jupiter. So uh, Caleb, um, where do we see Jupiter here? All right, so you're gonna wanna look uh, around the handle of the teapot. Uh, 
you're going to want to look a little bit up to up above and to the left. Um, to that big bright star right there by the uh, by the hindquarters of the, of the centaur right there. Yeah, so, so this is that's, 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 that's Jupiter right there. So. Yeah, there's this really bright um, star-looking object. It's not a star. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. It reflects a lot of light, um, so it's uh, much brighter than the other bright object, which I was mentioning before, which is over here, which we're going to talk about too. That's another planet. Um, but first, let's talk more about Jupiter. And actually, Caleb's going to help us out with that. All right. Well, um, this is this is Jupiter, the, the the largest and the most massive planet in our solar system. If we were to put Earth along Jupiter's equator, um, we would have about eleven Earths spanning across Jupiter, and about two Earths could fit in uh, Jupiter's uh, biggest storm, known as the Great Red Spot, as you see right there. Um, also, um, um, you see that you see that other 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 object along the equator, uh, Jupiter. That's and that's another planet in the you know, social. Can anyone guess what this? Yeah. So, can anyone guess what this planet okay. is? That is just we're lining it up just to get a sense of scale to see how big Jupiter is compared to some of the planets in our solar system, and that's actually the smallest planet in our solar system. Yeah, that would be our Mercury. Uh, yeah, so planet Mercury. Uh, it's, if you actually, it's, actually, it's actually quite a bit bigger than the moon, actually. So. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's see uh, Jupiter out in space. So if we kind of imagine a trip to Jupiter, what would that look like? What's around Jupiter? What's all these lines here? Caleb, help us out. Um, these are actually all of Jupiter's moons, actually. Um, Jupiter has recorded about 75 moons. And that's only the ones that are confirmed. Uh, the, um, and so far, um, so Jupiter has, uh, uh, does not have the largest amount of moons, but it has, but like the numbers left rediscovered, it's, it's quite a lot. So um, Jupiter has four main moons, which we know as the Galilean moons, known as Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. And, and the number always changes. Um, scientists uh, now think that there's like 79 moons around Jupiter, which is quite impressive. And here's, I think, the, those moons that you're just mentioning, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. Cool. Does anyone have a favorite? What's the one on the top there? Io. Io. Io is my favorite. That's classic. That's my I, favorite. Yeah, yeah classic Io. It kind of looks like a pizza. Io yeah. is the uh, most volcanically active uh, um, object in the solar system itself. Yeah, it's really active. It has all these volcanoes. It has, um, you know, they say it smells like rotten eggs, actually. All the sulfur. Maybe I wouldn't eat it. Yeah, even if it looks like, you know, pizza, you probably don't want to eat it, yeah. Uh, so something recent um, came out about Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, right, Caleb? Yes, um, they found that uh, on Ganymede, there's a impact crater, which is about the largest impact crater in the solar system itself. I believe it's, it's at, um, the news said it was about 100 miles wide in mm -hmm. diameter. Yeah, so there's like a huge impact crater, and we're not actually looking at it in this picture. Like this looks like a really bright area. Um, probably something hit it and exposed some bright ice underneath the more dirty surface of the moon. Um, but that's that's not the one that they're talking about. I, I'm not sure that the one that they're talking about is in this picture, but they, I think, are thinking that it's some kind of feature like this dark area here. There's like this uh, ring almost on the moon and they think that it was caused by a collision with a really large asteroid um, tens of miles across so it's really pretty interesting that the small moon could survive that big of a collision i think all right what else do we got about we have saturn next right Oh, and I gave it away. Yep. So the other bright object here, 
by Jupiter is Saturn. And does it make sense to you all that Saturn here is less bright than Jupiter? What does our crew think here? Saturn's less bright than Jupiter. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And Jupiter's a little closer. Yeah. Sure. A little bit. Yeah, Jupiter's, Jupiter's quite a bit farther yeah, away. Yeah, so I think the, the distance that they are, so um, Jupiter is over 400 million miles away. Saturn is about 400 million miles past that. Depends on where they are in their orbits, of course. But um, so yeah, Saturn is farther away and it's smaller too, right? So it's gonna appear uh, less bright in the sky to us. So if you know that, you know, there's Jupiter and Saturn in the sky tonight, but you're not really sure which is which, the bigger one is the biggest, or the brighter one is the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. And the less bright one is the planet with the rings, Saturn. Uh, so we're gonna hear more um, about Saturn here. What do we have first? Well, you know, well, did you wanna, Caleb, um, talk about the Saturn in a telescope? Or someone wanted to just point out, I think Nicolette, who's in the chat, had some comments about how you can see Saturn's rings even with a, a pretty inexpensive telescope. Um, so maybe Nicolette will help out with that in the chat. Is it true that they're kind of icy and that's what makes them so reflective? Yes, absolutely. So we're gonna fly through Saturn's rings, but um, Similar to what uh, Caleb was talking about with Jupiter, we have a sense of scale here, hopefully, for folks. So we have the Earth across the equator of, Jup of uh, Saturn here, and you can see just how big it is compared to our planet. So not 11 Earths like Jupiter had around across it. Um, it's not as big as Jupiter, but still pretty large. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. So yeah, let's, let's see those rings. Let's learn more about those rings. Oh, well, first, sorry, can't forget this guy. Um, we have, uh, well, you all help me out here. Very real. Well, very, yeah, very Saturn's, real scenario. Saturn's, Saturn's density is uh, less than water. So if you replace Saturn, you know, hypothetically speaking, in a planet-sized bathtub, um, speak, hypothetically speaking, it would float on top of the water. Uh, but realistically, we know that could not happen. But the density of Saturn is so low, it could float on water, so. Yeah, I got, yeah, if there was some way to get it to sit in water. Yeah. The ultimate bath bomb. <laughs> exactly what would happen, too. I think that, um, you know, when we we're trying to find a good picture of Saturn, just to talk about the density of it um, and slow density, uh, there's some realistic looking ones, but like we know that this is never going to happen, right? So we, we got to pick a cartoon looking one just so um, it looks um, as unrealistic as possible. All right, now now about those rings. So even it's as though it's the second largest planet in our solar system, the rings span for hundreds of thousands of miles from edge to edge. They're really, really um, wide, but they're really quite thin. They're only about 30 feet thick, which is amazing, I think. I didn't know that. That's impressive we can see them from how far away we are. Yeah, that's like a razor's edge compared to space. Yeah, so if we see it like edge on, depending on where it is in its orbit around our sun and where we are in our orbit um, on Earth, we can sometimes see it more edge on. And that actually um, lets the light skim across the rings and it um, really can cast shadows on things that are a little bit higher. So they actually see some peaks in these rings um, that are caused by all the motion of these particles here. Uh, and going back to Melanie's question of, you know, what are these made out of? Uh, Caleb, did you have um, some information on that that you wanted to share with us? Oh, yes. Um, most of these rings, the, the main composition of these rings is mostly uh, dust and ice. Um, the smallest these, these objects can be about, it's about, the, the, about a great, the size of the greatest sand. The largest they can be is about the size of a garage. So 
Yeah. Um, these objects, they, they look, they look like they're flat, but really they're not. So, you know, there's a lot, it's a lot of material there. Yeah. And, and, um, they are made of mostly ice with so just, just a tiny amount of dust. I think they're like 99.999% ice. Um, they look a little dirtier here in this simulation, I feel like, than they would be in real life. Um, but they're reflecting a lot of light. Um, think of like uh, the winter time uh, when you have snow all around you. Uh, sometimes you feel like you might need even wear sunglasses outside because the sun's so reflective. Uh, these rings are really reflective because they are made out of the ice. And quick poll, is this real? Are all of these images here real, do you think? So I know the crew here knows the answer to that. Uh, so what's what do we think, everyone? I'm gonna say a simulation. <laughs> I don't I think it's the matrix for sure. Yeah, I don't think it <laughs> no, it's not real. <laughs> it is not real. Yeah, they like, they look beautiful, but um, and then and Kendall actually um, got it too. They are not real. It's a simulation. Um, it would be really cool to fly through those in real life, but it's really dangerous. Um, they're very, uh, it's very dense um, in some of the areas of the rings. So even the Cassini spacecraft that we sent there, we did not want to put it through those rings and damage that spaceship, our spacecraft, even though we eventually had that spacecraft crash into Saturn and get destroyed by the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, they didn't want to collide it with the ring particles and lose control over it or really impressive. mess it all up there. Yeah. Uh, but we know what those ring particles are made out of and how um, big they are because of the light that they reflect. Light is actually really important to astronomers. It helps them understand things without actually going and taking a sample and setting it up close. So. All right, Mel, what's next? Uh, is it the trifid yeah nebula? yeah the trifid nebula so we're gonna see what else is in sagittarius so we're back at our teapot grouping of stars we're zoomed in a little bit tilted a little bit from what um we were looking at before but we have the teapot of stars there's that bright object there remember that's the planet jupiter and you can see all of that tonight after sunset uh we are we were looking at the sky after sunset here in muncie tonight facing south but there's more than meets the eye, right? So um, there are other objects that are not as visible in this picture here. And Melanie's gonna help us explore them. And so one in particular. theoretically, if we could fly to this object, it might look something like this. Okay, so We're simulation or real pictures? Simulation. No, this one's real. Real? Yes. I didn't think it could be that pretty in real life. These are real, yeah. These are real telescopic images of that area. It was a simulation first, but we transitioned to real here. Everything we're seeing now is real. It's hard to tell sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So obviously it's significantly brighter in that specific area, and that's because it's what's called a stellar nebula. So a lot of stars are being born, which is what's kind of illuminating all of this gas and dust surrounding it, which gives us some pretty colors. It looks like cotton candy a little bit. Does. But it's really kind of a lot more aggressive than that with, you know, nuclear fusion and things like that going on. But it also looks pretty. Yeah, so like a nebula is this big cloud of gas and dust in space, and the gas as it gets, you know, energized by the light that is being created by the newborn stars in it, it shines different colors. So a nebula is just a cloud of gas and dust in space, and it shines really bright, like like uh, Melanie was saying. And how did how did it get its name? Because I've talked about the Trifid Nebula a lot, but I actually never knew how it got its name. Yeah, so it's called Trifid because it's known as the three lobes. Um, so there's like three distinct areas of it. Which I thought was cool. <laughs> yeah, so it's like three distinct types of nebulae. Um, so there's a lot of different types. There, there's nebula, which are a result from stars dying. Then there's stellar nurseries, where stars are being born. 
Um, and then there's some other types too. And so it looks like there's three different um, some types, three different types here that uh, led to the naming trifid. That's another good example of why light is important because these different colors that we're observing can tell us different things. Because um, the tricky thing about astronomy is we can't just go out and get a sample of these things. We just have to, you know, make our best guess and do what we can from where we are. Yeah, this is uh, 5,000 light years away from us. I didn't plan that far ahead yet. 5,000 light years, yeah. Anyone um, want to explain what a light year is? Um, I do. I'll do it. Um, a light year is what we in astronomy call a measure of distance. It's uh, the distance it takes light to travel in one year. So if we're talking about like um, 5,000 light years, uh, if the distance it would take light, light to travel, travel that distance um, in 5,000. 5,000 years. So if we were traveling at the speed of light towards this object, we would reach, reach it in 5,000 years. Yeah. From the perspective of someone on our Earth, <laughs> if we were traveling the speed of light to it, we would experience time differently because of a whole bunch of rules of uh, space time. Yeah, we would that. experience so, zero time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love Einstein. Absolutely. Uh, time is, is definitely interesting. Um, so a light year, um, amazing explanation, Caleb. It's about 6 trillion miles, if that helps you understand a light year more. And we can't travel that fast as of now. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, we can't actually travel that fast. Yeah, it's like uh, the cosmic speed limit, right? Yeah, you're not allowed to cross it. Yeah. Big speeding ticket if you do Okay, um, so we're back at our night sky. We're looking south right after sunset here in Muncie. We have a lot more stars in the Milky Way um, than maybe what we would see and observe on campus with all of the light pollution. Uh, but you can definitely see or try to see those stars that make up the teapot of Sagittarius and check out those other bright objects, Jupiter and Saturn, by the teapot as well. But there's more. There's not just a nebula in this region of the sky. There's not just Jupiter and Saturn or other stars or stars out there, excuse me. There's an object that is off the spout of the teapot. So here's the spout of the teapot. And if you kind of go about twice the distance that these two stars are away um, from this location. So one, two, around here. It's a really cool object, right, Ricky? Yeah, uh, we've actually got the coolest object. It's our black hole. It's our very own black hole. Like we think every galaxy has one, and this one's ours. Um, All right, so black holes. There's a lot of them out there, but in the center of our galaxy, where that, if we're looking in that region of the sky. Um, has a really m large one, really massive one. It's got a lot of stuff in it, right? Yeah, it does. So what's, um, what are we looking at here? I'm going to pause. I'm so going to stop it here so we can explain. This is a simulation going in towards our black hole. It's a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star, spelled with an asterisk, pronounced like a star. Um, and we've actually known about it for about 100 years, but we couldn't actually prove it was a black hole until about 20 years ago. And we didn't know too much about it until maybe 10 years ago. Uh, so in the 30s, a guy named Carl Jansky, um, he was just looking for static for Bell Labs, for figuring out sources of static for transatlantic phone calls. And he mostly found thunderstorms and stuff like that. And, but he found something else that pointed out in his space. And Bell Labs didn't much care. They only cared about phone calls. But astronomers cared. Um, so they looked into it. And they found that there was this radio source in Sagittarius, um, and they just named it Sagittarius A. Uh, but they couldn't really tell too much about it because they didn't have very good telescopes back then. Um, so 40 years go by, and we get to the 1970s, we have a little bit better telescopes, um, and they can actually prove that it's 
got to be a black hole. Like, it's the only thing that we know of in physics that's massive enough to show the effects that we see around this area. Um, so they actually coined the name Sagittarius A star um, after a practice from atomic physics um, where when you have an atom in an excited state, you put an asterisk on it so that it's excited. And since this was such an exciting discovery, Sagittarius A star. Um, but I was it wasn't wondering where until the star the came two, from. Yeah, that's exactly. Well, that's where I heard it came from. I don't know for sure. Yeah. You know, but you weren't there, story. basically. You weren't I, in well, the room when it happened. If I was, I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in the 2000s, we actually got a, like a really good video because finally we we have computing power enough that we can take radio telescopes and kind of link them together like Voltron and make them act like they're a much bigger telescope. Yeah, um, so, so that we. Kind so of call that an interferometer. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Uh, so really quick, uh, simulation or real pictures and imagery here? What do we think? I Ricky? think it's more matrix stuff. It's more matrix stuff. More matrix stuff. OK, mm -hmm. simulation. Yeah, so this Definitely is a simulation. simulation. Um, but hopefully, uh, yeah, so Ricky said that we did actually eventually get some real images of this area of the sky um so before we fade into that um explain what we're really looking at here in this simulation right here so i tried to get a mouse to point at stuff <laughs> um so we're let's looking at a bunch of stars orbiting the center of this picture and we can see uh, the little yellow light that I well everyone's covering it but I think this is one light year is that what we're at right now let's see just the yellow one radius one light month one light month mm -hmm. so it, just like a light year it's the distance light travels in a month um, so we have all these stars that are close to the black hole that are orbiting it that's what we're seeing now and then when we go in we'll just get closer and closer until you can actually see just a black spot on the sky with stars Okay, so the simulation, there's the black hole in the middle, and the stars are going around it. Okay, mm -hmm. so, re okay, simulation here. Now let's switch over to real life. Yeah, so these are the actual telescopic images, and you can see this star at the end just zipping real fast around. Um, that star is the star S2. Um, it's actually going at about 2% of the speed of light during that little zip, which is incredibly fast. Um, and it has, it goes around this black hole about once every 16 years. These are actually um, a bunch of telescopic images that are a composite of over 16 years of data. Um, and we, we can just time lapse it for us so we can see the actual motion of all these. So this is sped up, objects. basically. Yeah. Well, not deep sky objects, but mid-galaxy objects. <clears throat> um, and uh, one thing before I talk about the difference between this and that, uh, we actually last month clocked uh, another star that gets even closer to the black hole. And when you get closer to something you're orbiting, you go faster. And this thing was going 8% of the speed of light, which is, that should get a speeding ticket on its own. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's not that fast. <laughs> Could be faster. Uh, so this, yeah, it could be faster, I guess. So this is a, a simulation of an active black hole. Our black hole, Sagittarius A star, is actually inactive, which means it's not currently sucking in a lot of stuff. Not a lot of stuff is falling into it. Um, so it's not that bright right now. But when you look, see this, when you have a black hole that's actively eating all of your, everything around it, they get really bright because all these things, they're getting sucked up, they're getting torn apart. All these molecules are getting accelerated and they emit light when that happens. Yeah. Um, so... Oh, but another thing that we found out in the 2000s from actually that those telescopic images, um, you can invoke Kepler's law and you can actually calculate how massive the black hole is. Uh, it's about four million times more massive than our sun. So it's a big boy.
so the black hole in the center of our galaxy is four million solar masses. It's four million times the mass of our sun. That's amazing. Yeah. And there's other black holes in our galaxy, right? The one at the center is just the... the yeah, the one at the center is just our biggest. Yeah. Which I, I, I think, off the top of my head, it's not very big for a supermassive black hole. There's definitely more massive ones. Um, I think Melanie has a picture of one that we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you have, like, like here right now, you have an inactive black hole. This is more like what our black hole is doing. It's just a hole in space that warps gravity around it. Yeah, so if we're really far away from this object, we really want to be able to see it unless we... In, observed the gravitational effects that it placed on nearby stars, right? Yeah, we could only infer that it was there. Exactly, yeah. So um, if you're wondering, this, you know, this stuff that's kind of warping around it, it almost looks like maybe that's an accretion disk or this disk of material that we kind of saw in the previous one. Uh, but that's actually light, distant light coming from other stars and other objects in our galaxy that when it passes by this really massive object, um, it actually gets bent a little bit um, and warped so that we see it do weird things like we're seeing it here. It's called gravitational lensing um, because the gravity of the black hole is just so powerful, it actually bends light. That's so, so easy. Active versus inactive. Both of these are just simulations, though. Um, we haven't been to a black hole up close. It's, they're way too far away. We barely made it outside of our own solar system, and our solar system is much smaller than um, any of these distances that we've been talking about, like the Trifid Nebula is 5,000 light years away, and this one, um, this object here. So if this was Sagittarius A star, um, the supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, um, it's what, like 25,000 light years away or so? Roundabouts, yeah. Yeah. So how does a black hole go from active to inactive and vice versa? I think you kind of talked about that. Well, we yeah, so it, here. yeah, it goes from inactive to active by something being unfortunate enough to get close to it and become gravitationally bound and start getting sucked in. When you get too close to something that's a lot bigger than you, it tears you apart like what we just saw in here. And then that's how we get these accretion disks. And as those particles get closer and closer to the event horizon, which is the point of no return, once you pass that, you're not coming back. Um, they get hotter and hotter and they move faster and faster and they get brighter. Um, and then eventually all of this dust will get into the black hole unless it's fortunate enough to get into a, like a perfect orbit. Uh, yeah. All right, so what's this guy? So real or fake, or real or simulation? Mel? I'll give him a minute because I really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've been talking about black holes. This is a black hole, but is it a real picture or is it a simulated picture or image? If you have a guess, put it in the chat. All right, Mel. All right, so this is actually a real picture. And not only is it a real picture, it's the first picture that we've ever taken of a black hole. Um, maybe you heard about it just over a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half ago on April 10th, 2019. Um, there was a lot of buzz in the astronomy community because a lot of times we don't get a lot of new, really exciting news. We have to wait a long time for it. So this, this is one of those things that we've been waiting almost exactly 100 years for. Um, we had the math to prove, like Ricky said, that these were black holes and they did exist, but we've never actually visually seen them or captured them. So it was, you know, really exciting to astronomers to have something so new and exciting happen in our lifetime, uh, just because of how long it takes to find these things and how much work goes into finding these things. So we can see here, it's actually really bright, kind of how Ricky explained. Because when you think of a black hole, you think, oh, it's really dark, but we can see here that um, if you think this is active or, or inactive, you can leave that in the chat too. Um, 
but it's just one of those really exciting things that we got lucky for and we were finally able to actually prove. So all of these simulations or models that you've seen uh, previously were, you know, they weren't real. We've never actually captured an image of a black hole. Um, so it was, I don't know, a really special moment, I think, for everybody. Um, but we didn't just guess on these simulations and what they looked like. They were based on a lot of math. And so they were real. We weren't just guessing. Um, but to have this visual optical proof has really excelled us forward in our study of black holes. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we're working currently on getting a picture of our own Sagittarius A star, which I really hope they're able to do. Yeah, me too. So this black hole is in another galaxy many, many light years away, millions of light years away. Um, but yet they still got it, which is amazing. It's just, it's huge though. It's, um, you know, our, our Sagittarius A star, a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy is about 4 million solar masses. So 4 million times the mass of our sun. But this one, any guesses of how massive this one is? Does anyone here know actually the, the crew here? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> No, I don't know. Yeah, it's not millions, but billions of times the mass of our sun. So like three to six billion times the mass of our sun for this one. So a lot more powerful. It's active. Um, so if you got that, uh, Melanie was like, is it inactive or active? Put it in the chat if you think, or what for what you think. And it's active because it has that light going around it, um, that light that we can observe anyway, from the material going around it, getting heated up and sped up by the forces here. But it's really massive, so it's just it's huge, right? And so um, XKCD has amazing um, graphics for lots of different things, and they actually released this one here for the M87 black hole, and compared it to our solar system. So we have the sun in the center here um, that's just depicted with this little cartoon. Uh, of, of course, um, you know, this isn't real life. We don't find suns or the sun in a black hole. Uh, we're just trying to get a sense of scale. How big is this black hole? And to do that, we have to compare it to our whole solar system because its effects are really apparent and really, really large here. Um, so we have the sun at the center, and you can see the orbit of Pluto. And we sent out Voyager, a spacecraft, a long time ago to explore space. Um, it's already out um, past beyond Pluto. But it's huge. I think it's helpful because when you look at it, it's really hard to guess how big it is just with numbers. So I think it's good to put it in perspective a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think numbers um, kind of go over, they go over my head um, for sure sometimes. So having this comparison, like we know Pluto is really far away. Um, and you know, the the orbit here is, is shown as so small compared to the dark area, the black hole shadow, we call it, um, there in the picture. Okay. So since we're talking about Pluto, Caleb actually um, brought up an interesting fact about Pluto, um, that it's in our sky tonight, right, Caleb? You yes, um, I was... Uh looking up star maps and I actually found, <coughs> found that actually Pluto can be found in Sagittarius right now, although you will not be able to see it. You need a very powerful, you need a very powerful telescope to be able to see it. You cannot um, see it with a, with a one, you have, you have like a mall bar. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, and you need to know exactly where to look and like, it's just, it's a big process. That's why it took a long time to find, right? But it's somewhere around here, I think, if I remember correctly, right? It's in between Saturn and Jupiter. Pluto can be found yeah, right. right around in here. But again, you can't see it, not even with the help of a telescope, really. It's it, If you had a telescope, even a really good one, it just looked like a star in the sky, really, um, another star. But but it's not a star, right? It's, a, it's not a planet either. Uh, it's a dwarf planet, Pluto is, right? Yeah, I think it's the second biggest one. What's the biggest yeah. one then, Ceres? It might, it might be Ceres. I don't remember. It might be yeah, the biggest one. Yeah, I think Ceres is a bit larger. Um, but I know it's up there. 
Okay, well, Nicola and Alec can help us out and figure out what one's bigger because I can't remember off the top of my head either what's the largest dwarf planet out there. But Pluto is definitely one of the largest. I thought Pluto was the largest, but... I think it was at first, maybe. They found I other ones, I don't, I don't right? remember the exact... Yeah, there's others. Yeah, they found yeah. other ones, and so um, there's even more dwarf planets out there that they haven't cataloged yet. There's um, the confirmed ones, but there's, you know, there's so much out there that they just haven't really uh, put into a catalog because they haven't voted on, on these objects and where they should really exist in their classification, so... Yeah, I think Pluto is the only one we have up close pictures of, though, so we can have that. Well, we have pictures of Ceres too. Up close, Ceres, yeah, up close pictures of Ceres oh, yeah, in the asteroid enough. belt. So Ceres is in the asteroid belt. It's pretty close. It's pretty um, easy to get to, and that's in between Mars and Jupiter, um, mostly. I'm gonna go look those up after this. Yeah, there's this really bright spot on Ceres. Um, you probably you might have seen it before, just not realized that it was Ceres. But there's this really bright spot on Ceres and. It was a big deal about what it was, and it's just, I think, salty water. <laughs> but, yeah. I have a quick question from somebody that was having a little bit of trouble using the chat, but they asked, uh, I wanted to know if an inactive black hole could ever become highly active again. Okay, yeah. so, yeah, inactive to active. Um, so we saw uh, that star get taken into the black hole, and at first it was inactive, and then it took in a star and became active. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not very likely that that would happen because our sh galaxy is actually pretty calm, much calmer than it was, um, you know, back in, in time in the future. Um, and so it's not really likely that would happen. Um, but for instance, we are on a collision course. Our galaxy is on a collision course with another galaxy out there called Andromeda. And when that collides, it might um, create some motion and might um, kind of push some things into some black holes um, through the effects of gravity. So that to... might um, actually stimulate. But that's not going to happen for yeah. like 5 billion years or so, I think. Yeah, we'll be gone. Yeah. You won't be long gone. <laughs> All right, so speaking of galaxies, um, there's our Milky Way galaxy, which we see as a band of light in our sky. And when we're looking at this area of the sky, we're looking into the plane of our galaxy where there's millions and millions, actually hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, but in this area, one area, there's probably just millions of stars, right? Um, and when we look out away from that area, and we look at these stars over here, we're actually still looking inside of our galaxy because we're inside our galaxy and we're looking out at it around us, it surrounds us. Um, so let's actually take a trip, an imaginary trip, outside of our galaxy to see what it might look like from the outside. Because we're inside it, we can't see what it looks like out from the outside. We don't have the technology to reach that far, it's too big. But we can do that in our simulation here, in our software here. I think Ricky had a good analogy to describe like why it's so difficult to look at our own galaxy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like um, trying to figure out what you look like without a mirror. Yeah, it's very difficult. All right, so this is all a simulation. But we know that our galaxy, um, or we don't know for sure, but we have good, a good idea that our galaxy is a spiral shape so we see other galaxies that kind of have this spiral shape these spiral arms we call them and there's this feature in the center here this bright area and it's kind of elongated it's not a circle like what we see in other galaxies so it's a bar feature so we actually think our galaxy is a barred spiral because it has that barred feature and it has these spiral arms um, and it might actually have two bars. So instead of just the one here, it might have another one going along this way, and it might be a double barred spiral. So there's a lot of things we actually don't know about it, but um, we have a pretty good idea that it's about 100,000 light years from edge to edge. And at the center of this here, right around here, is where the Sagittarius A star is, that supermassive black hole. 
And can we see it in this picture? No. Or this model? No. Um, it's just way too small on the scale to see. But Do you want to point out where our solar system is, just for reference? Isn't our it like solar third? system is about two thirds of the way out from that. It's about twenty five thousand light years, so pretty far. I think this would be around somewhere like here. I think, like right here. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about. Yeah. That jives with the pictures I've seen. Yeah. Good. I've seen myself, though. I would wave. Yeah, when I was creating this with our planetarium boring. software, I actually had the constellation line still up for Sagittarius. And um, when you have those up, you can see uh, where it is um, out in space compared to our sun. Uh, so we had little lines um, showing the location of our solar system area. And uh, I, I seem to remember it being around around that area but one of mm -hmm. those things where if you program it out um, you can get an exact um, uh, representation of where it would be yeah all right any final thoughts crew we had a lot today there's a lot of content maybe too much we had black holes we had nebulae we had planets we had our solar system, we had our galaxy, but there's still more out in space that we can explore. So we're gonna be looking at another object next week. Melanie, do you remember? Another constellation, actually a whole group of constellations. It was kind of your idea. Oh yeah, we're saying kind of goodbye to summer uh, by appreciating our summer triangle while we can still see it. Um, there's some real treats in there, so tune in. Yeah, so we're going to look at um, the Summer Triangle, which Melanie mentioned before is an asterism, not one of the 88 official constellations, but a group of them um, that actually create this triangle in the sky that's really easy to see. But I won't give too much of that away because we have uh, 45 minutes to talk about it next Friday at 6.30. We hope that you can join us then. Um, thanks so much, everyone. If you do have any questions and you're watching this later, put them in the chat. We'll try to answer them too. But have a great evening and a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.